So this is the third lecture, the second lecture now we're gonna do on indexes. So last class was all about discussing the sort of traditional latching techniques and locking techniques that you have to have for all to be indexes. So today we're gonna actually spend time talking about the um, so sort of what's in, sort of in vogue for the last decade of building lock-free or latch-free data structures. Um, so I'm gonna actually talk about just three data structures today and it's sort of a, the, even though the lecture is supposed to be about latch-free, only the second two, the skip list and the BW tree are latch free. The first one, the T tree, is not latch free. I'm just presenting it for uh, historical context to understand what people have done for in memory databases uh, in the past. Okay? So, again, we'll go through uh, the, 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 spend most of our time talking about the BW tree, but sort of understand what, how certain design decisions they make in this, we gotta understand what, what they're doing up in, up in the skip list. All right, so the, as we said last class, the original B plus tree from the 1970s was designed, what's wrong, Gary? All right. This is gonna be YouTube too, you know that, right? Sorry, sorry. That's okay. No, sorry, sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I can anything if you want to curse. Okay, sorry. I'll okay. okay. need to delete it out, so thank you. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so uh, that I gotta believe. Okay, um, right. So the B, the B, B plus tree back in the 1970s was designed to deal with slow disks, right? So with with disks in the spinning disk hard drives, it's all about sequential access. So you design the nodes in such a way that if you need to do a range scan along the leaf nodes, that's going to be a bunch of sequential reads. Um, the but now we're going to say we're going to store things in, entirely in main memory. The question is like, is that is the B plus tree going to be the right data structure still, still for us, right? Did people try to look at other things to say if I know my my data set's entirely in main memory, uh, could I would I would I choose different data structures to to that will get, maybe get better performance than the B plus tree? So people did try that. Uh, going back to the 1980s, uh, there was some early work done at the University of Wisconsin on building the first in memory databases. Of course, back then, memory was super limited and super expensive, so they were really talking about you know, databases in the size of megabytes, right? But they, at least they recognized that at some point, DRAM will get large enough and we could have databases fit entirely in main memory. So they did a bunch of great early work with Dave DeWitt and his students on um, uh, building out uh, you know, prototype databases that were based on this premise that everything's in memory. So the Data structure they end up building was this thing called a T-tree. Quick show of hands, who has, who has ever heard of T-tree before? Nobody, that's fine, perfect. Um, so T-trees are gonna look like AVL trees, but the key distinction about them versus the B plus tree and, and other data structures we'll talk about is that since in their world back in the 1980s, memory was super limited, that they didn't wanna store copies of keys in the indexes. Instead, you store pointers to the tuples, right? In the B plus tree, or, or in the BW tree, or the skip list, everything we're talking about here, like whatever your, whatever your keys or index are based on, you're gonna make copies of them in the actual data structure itself. In the T tree, what we'll see in the next slide, they'll also have pointers to the original tuples because they didn't wanna have to make copies of the key because that would, that would be wasted space or take up too much space. So again, in the 1980s, this was proposed out of the uh, at, at University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, in the 1990s, when people started building the first uh, in-memory databases, like commercial in-memory databases, these first prototypes that came out had, had T-trees. So times 10 is the most famous one. That was originally small base out of HP Labs, and, and then they forked it off and did, and did a startup, and then the startup got renamed to times 10, and then Oracle bought times 10 in like 2006. So I think actually even today, you can, by default, you get a B plus tree if you use times 10, but you can, there's a flag you can set to go back and use a T-tree. And there's some other databases out there that are designed to work in like really extreme memory environments, like embedded devices and stuff like that. And those guys are going to use T-trees as well. But nowadays, there's no sort of major commercial in-memory database that's going to use a T-tree. And we'll see why in a sec. So let's see what it looks like. So the name T-tree comes from the fact that its, its nodes are, are sort of represented to look like T's. So within a single node, you're gonna have a bunch of pointers. So the first you're gonna have in here is you're gonna have the data pointers. 
So these are going to just be pointers out to the corresponding tuples that, that they're mapped to, right? So again, say I'm, I'm, I'm building this node here. I have key 5, key 2, and key 8. I'm not going to store copies of those keys in the actual node itself. I just have a pointer there, right? So again, think back then in the 1980s, right? These keys could be 16 bits. Uh, the pointers are probably 16 bits. So rather than having to store the data plus the pointer, which is 32 bits, I just store the 16-bit pointer to get to the, to the, 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 the tuple that I want. Then I'm also going to have uh, pointers that allow me to go to my siblings as well back to the parent. So the t again, the T tree is going to look like an AVL tree. So it doesn't mean that when we do traversal, we're always going to the bottom and scanning along the leaf nodes. We may have to go back up, right? Because uh, it's going to be organized in breath first search order or breath first order. And so we need to have a parent pointer to know how to go back where we came from. The only copies of the keys we're going to maintain under index are node boundaries. So within a node, for these data pointers, for the tuples that I'm pointing to, I'll have the, the min key, the lowest key that's represented by them. So that would represent whatever the copy of the key for this, this, this uh, pointer here, and then the max key, this one here. So in this sort of toy example, I'm only showing three pointers, right? So it's, it's not that big of a win, but you know, imagine if you're storing maybe you know, 128 or 256 keys per, in, uh, per node. So now the, you know, the, the, the min and max are just uh, a, a trivial amount. So let's see how you would actually do a uh, traversal in this. So here's a really simple three node T tree. Um, and then there's the data table. So it's key one through nine. And so starting at this node here, say I want to do a lookup on K2. So you see, again, these are all data pointers to the actual keys themselves. So I can't just, when I do a comparison, I have to follow these pointers to figure out when it you know, does something equal something, I have to follow those pointers to go look at the original tuple, and then do the comparison that way. And again, I have my pointers down to my, to my uh, children here, left, left and right. So I start out, and I want to do the first thing I'm going to do is do a comparison, see whether K2 is less than K4, because that's going to tell me whether the key I'm looking for, it could either be in this range here or down on the, the right side of the tree. So in this case, K2 is less than K4. So I know I need to follow the, the, the sibling pointer, or the, sorry, the child pointer, and go down here. So now what I do is look and see whether K2 is uh, less than K1, what's well, greater than that. Then I check my max bound here to see whether it's, it's greater than this. Uh, it's not. So I know it's in between this range. So now I'm just going to do a scan and follow the pointer, then do my comparison. Is the thing I'm looking for equal the, the key over in the actual data table itself? K2 doesn't equal K1. In this case here, K2 equals K2, and then we found our match. So there's obviously a bunch of optimizations we can do for this, right? Th these things will be sorted just, just like a B plus tree node. So I can do binary search to jump around. If I was looking for K3, and then I found that this thing, you know, the, the, the boundary node, the boundary key was equivalent to the thing I was looking for, then I know I don't need to do a binary search. I just jump to it. Right? There's some obvious optimizations you can do, but, but the main takeaway here is that you always have to follow the pointer to get to the original key in order to do your comparison. Is this clear? So now if I want to do a range scan, I don't have an example of this, but if I want to do a range scan, say like from K3 to K, K6, I do all the same search to come down here, right, and, and then scan along to find the keys that I want, but when I reach the end, I would recognize that the upper, the upper bound for my range scan is greater than this, and now I gotta go back up and then do scan along and potentially go down here as well. So you can't make this latch free because it requires you to update uh, pointers in, in, or two memory locations at one, at one time when you wanna uh, do splits and merges. All right, so you have to use traditional uh, latching techniques. All right, so the advantage of T-trees and sort of why people thought they were a good idea back, back in the day is obviously because they use less memory because you're not, again, you're not copying the keys. You leave everything in the data table themselves. Um, the, the downside is, as I said, it's difficult to rebalance because you could have splits and merges coming from the, the top going down and the bottom going up, and you need, you, need, you need to be able to reconcile them. We saw the same problem before when we talked about B-trees last class. Um, and of course now, if you have to go uh, do a scan, you have to go do the lookup on, on the table itself. And that's going to be in direction in, in, your, in your instruction pipeline, because you're following pointers, jumping to some other location, then doing comparison. And that's going to be slow. So now, 
got to understand, back in the 1980s, again, memory was quite limited, so this sort of made sense. The other aspect that'll make sense uh, for us when we talk about the BW, BW tree in a sec, and a little bit about the skip list, is that this is also not very cache friendly because we're going doing this indirection to go look up into another location in memory. Back in the 1980s, the, the speed difference between CPU caches and you know, regular memory was not as significant as it is today. So it, back in their world, taking a cache miss wasn't like a, you know, a huge, huge problem like it is in ours. Right? It's not orders of magnitude uh, slower. So then for, them, for, for them having to go chase all these pointers, you can also argue too that the, the CPUs are much more uh, uh, sort of simplistic and didn't do, uh, uh, you know, wasn't doing branch prediction as aggressively as we're doing now. So maybe some of the, the aspects of doing this wasn't as problematic in, in their CPU architecture as well. So again, T-trees only appear in, in sort of uh, really small embedded devices and in some of the older uh, in-memory databases. Nobody actually uses them today. But I think it's at least interesting uh, to know because at some point in your life, someone might say like, oh, what didn't they try to build an in-memory index back in the 1980s, 1990s? Should we, we be using that? Like I remember I was at a conference one time. The guy was like, yeah, it wasn't, you know, why are you guys using B plus trees? Shouldn't you be using T trees? No, right? The answer is no. Okay. All right, any questions about T-trees? All right, so let's talk about latch-tree data structures. So the, the order preserving indexes that we're trying to build here, um, the easiest way to actually implement one, the dumbest way to actually implement one, is just have a sorted linked list, right? You have different locations of memory, and each element in the linked list has a key followed by a pointer to, to the next element, right? So this is the easiest for us to actually maintain, and it's easiest for us to make uh, latch free because anytime we want to add a new entry into our index, we just do a compare and swap on this memory location and insert our new guy. All right? Of course, now the problem with this is that scanning this sucks because it's always going to be uh, a linear search. Right? You have to start from the beginning and scan along. So what's one really simple way to sort of speed this up? Instead of scanning every single one, what if I just had some extra pointers to allow me to scan over every, every second one, right? So say I'm looking for uh, key three, rather than having to do key one, key two, key three, if I just look up in this one here and, and then, oh, I can jump to key three and I'm done, right? I keep going, right? I can add another layer above this. Now I'm skipping, since, instead of skipping every, every second one, I skip every fourth one. So now if I want to find key five, Instead of having to go, you know, scan along the bottom here, I can just jump over the, the top level list and jump there, right? This is basically what a skip list is, right? That's all it is. Skip list is just a bunch of uh, uh, a linked lists with different levels, and at each level, as you go up, you just have uh, you just have fewer fewer entries, and you can jump over more things. That's all it is. So. Again, if you sort of squint or maybe like rotate it, it is basically what a B plus tree is, right? Because the B plus tree, you have those guideposts of the inner nodes at the top, and that's just allowing you to skip over a bunch of stuff instead of having to do the linear scan on the bottom, right? It's just sort of organized in, in a slightly different way. And the skip lists are considered a sort of a probabilistic data structure because they, you, to decide whether you add a pointer at the upper levels, you flip a coin. Right, you pick a random number, and if, if it evaluates to true, then you decide as you insert a new key, you're going to add a, a, an extra pointer. Right? Whereas the B plus tree, you just insert to the bottom, and then if you have to do a split, that'll modify what, what guideposts are at the top. So what that gives you is that now when we do insertions into a skip list, all the changes will be localized. Meaning, just like before, when I was back here, if I needed to insert key 2.5, the only thing I need to do is just update this pointer here to now point to me. It doesn't affect anybody else. In a B plus tree, if these guys are packed into the same node and it can't take a new key, then I have to do a split which may sort of reorganize the entire tree. So skip list, all the changes will end up being localized. And although we're doing, it's a public data structure, right? On average, we'll get approximately log n. We'll get the same asymptotic guarantees that you would get from a B plus tree, even though it's, it's a non-deterministic tree. 
So let's look at a full example here. So the first thing to point out is that we have a begin and end marker here. And these guys are uh, on, on the begin side, they have like the entry point for uh, the, the link list at a given level. And then at the end point here, you have some special marker that says this is the end, right? It's infinity or some bit pattern say, if you reach this point, then this is the end of this level. And then now for the different levels, you just have the probability that, that a key will exist at each level. So at the, at the very bottom, the probability that, that a key has to exist is one, because every key must exist at the bottom level, right? Because that's the, the, sort of the, the ground truth of what keys are in, are in our skip list. And then as we go up, the probability is divided by two, right? So, so again, so along the bottom, these are all our keys. And then above here, we have these, uh, we have the pointers that are going to span multiple keys from the levels below us. And this point here, in, in, our, in our first example, there's nothing in there. So in skip lists parlance, the, the keys that are, that are uh, the, the sort of the, this little vertical stripe here, where you have entries for the same key, this is, this is called a tower, right? So this level here, I have K2. It's going to have a pointer to go along uh, horizontally to the next, next key in this level. It also can go vertically down to my own key, right? So you can't have a key here. Like K2 can't point to K3 from one level to the next. It always has to point to the same key. All right. So let's look at an example how, how to actually manipulate this. Let's say we, we want to insert K5 right here. So the very first thing we're going to do is allocate the, 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 the nodes for this, for this new key we want to insert. So we'll flip a coin, and every single time we get heads, we continue and say we're going to add it to a level. As soon as we get tails, then we stop adding it. We stop going up the tower. So let's say we flip a coin once, we get, we get heads, so we want to add it here. We flip a coin again, we add heads, we get heads, and we want to add a node here. We flip it the third time, and we get tails, so then we stop. So our tower is going to have three entries here. So now at this point, uh, our, our, we've added our nodes, but nobody else can see us yet, because this pointer for K4, he still points to K6, and this one still points to the end. And then for the top level, that pointer still points to the end as well. So now what we're going to have to do, and we'll see how to do this in a second, how to do this uh, without latches, we want to flip these pointers now to have them point to, point to us. And we're going to do this from the bottom to the top. Because what will happen is now if anybody's scanning along uh, the bottom here, they're guaranteed to see us, but it's not the case that we don't want the case where someone would come along and see K5 and have us not actually be in the full thing. Right, and we'll see how to do this in a second. All right, so now you want to do a search. Say I want to do a lookup on K3. So my cursor starts at the beginning, at the very top level. I scan along whatever this pointer points to, all right, and I do a comparison. I'm looking for K3. Is K3 less than K5? If it's K5 or equals, then I want to have my cursor go this direction and down. Uh, in this case here, K3 is less than K5, so I'll go down to the next level and do the same thing, look along this pointer and see what K, key it points to. So this one here is K3 is greater than K2. So that means that I know the key that I'm looking for, if it exists, has to be at this point in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the linked list or the skip list over, right? So I don't care about anything that comes before it because this thing told me that I, I, should, I should start my, my search in here. Right, so then I scan along, look ahead again, K3 is less than K4, so I know what I don't want to look there, so I go down, right? And now I just scan along the leaf nodes until I find, find what I want. So once you reach, reach the bottom, you're just doing linear search, but this is going to allow you to, again, the, the, the towers allow you to jump, jump over elements without having to look at everything. So what are the advantages of skip lists? Is, right, is, is this sort of clear? Right, who here has heard of skip lists before? All right, about half, okay. Um, so with skip lists, the advantage is that they typically use less mem memory than a, than, than a you know, off-the-shelf B plus tree uh, without any you know, uh, compression or, or uh, prefix uh, uh, truncation. Um, they typically use less because uh, you're not storing a bunch of extra pointers in the same way you would have for a B plus tree. Now, 
in the example that I'm showing here and the, the latch-free stuff we'll talk about, the linked list always goes in one direction. So if you have to do a reverse search, like an order by in descending order, then, then you have to do something special because you're not going to have pointers going in reverse direction. It's always me in one direction. And that's why they get the reduced size. We already talked about this before, but the insertions and deletions don't require rebalancing. Right? When I did that insert, all I did was flip pointers for the keys that, that appeared before me at, at, each, at each level. I didn't have to restructure or reorganize the, the entire tree or the entire, the entire data structure, so that's nice. And then we'll see in a second, we can actually implement a, a thread-safe concurrent skip list using only uh, compare and swap instructions, so without having to do any latching. So the way we're going to do that is that uh, when we flip those pointers now, we use compare and swap on them. We do it in the, in the right order, and that guarantees that our operations uh, can be done atomically. If the compare and swap fails, then we know that somebody else has come along and tried to insert something in the spot we were going to insert. So we just stop what we're doing and then just go back and try again. Remember we said this before. When we do modifications to a to a, 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 an index, if, in, in, if the, the operation fails, we want to go back and try it again. Like, with the exception of like if I try to insert something in the key already exists, that's a primary key failure, that's a logical thing we have to fail. But when I try to do this compare and swap stuff, if I fail, I don't want to abort the transaction because the transaction doesn't care that you compare and swap failed on the index. It doesn't know about anything about that. It wants, just, just wants to get its keys in the index. So if the compare and swap fails, the thread's going to go back and just retry the whole operation again, over and over again. Right? And that's what makes this latch free. Because you're not taking a latch on anything as you make the changes, and that's all hidden from you from the upper parts of the system. Right? So that's what I sort of mean here, is that, that, that the transaction can, can only abort from high-level conflicts, like did, I, uh, did two transactions try to insert to the same tuple with the same primary key? I don't care about conflicts of the low level data structure. Like if I two, two threads try to update the same pointer, that's something we're just going to retry. It has to be all hidden from, from the rest of the system. All right, so let's go back and see how we actually do the insert for, for real. So we want to insert K5. We, we want to do it here. So as I said, we can allocate the memory for the nodes we want to have in K5, but these guys are still pointing to around it. It doesn't know anything about that. So at this point here, although we've allocated the memory, and in my visualization, I'm showing you that we have K5 here. No thread can actually ever see it because they would follow this pointer along K4 and jump to K6. Right? So before I start doing compare and swap on uh, these guys here, I just got to make sure that my towers are all linked together. So this doesn't need to be atomic, done atomically. This is just, you just write in a memory as you set things up. And then same thing for going the, uh, in the other direction here. Right? So I know that if I'm inserting K5 between K4 and K6, that if anybody comes along and modifies this pointer before I do, that means I know that there's some node in between here, right? or K6 has gone away, and therefore I shouldn't be pointing to K6. I have to retry my operation to come back and figure out who got him before I, what, you know, who got him before I did. So I can, again, I got my pointers to where I think I should go, and this doesn't need to be done atomically without and without any latches. It's just I know that when th these things fail, actually just bottom one. When this bottom one fails, then I know something else happened. I gotta go figure out what, what's going on. All right, so I start at the bottom, and I want to do a compare and swap on this guy here. So the way I found it was when I did when, in order to do my insert, I had to scan along, you know, do a search and try to figure out where I should be. And so now I know what is the node before me. And I know what the node after me, so I know I get this pointer, and I know that I need to, need to do a compare and swap on this. Now, if this compare and swap succeeds, this uh, this 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 tuple is now fully, or sorry, this key is now fully visible in the uh, in the system. What still could happen, though? Say someone is looking for. Uh, uh, in this case here, someone's looking for K5, and I've only done this. So they could scan along here, and this thing still points to infinity, so they would come down and then they would see me. So that's okay. Right? 
But let's say that this thing pointed to uh, K6 instead. Okay, there was a K6 uh, tower like this. Someone come along, scan, and see K6, and think, oh, there's no K5. Is that okay? Is that allowed? Wouldn't they still have to drop down to verify since there's only a 50% probability at that level? Uh, so your statement is, wouldn't you have to, wouldn't you have to step down and verify because there's only 50% probability at that level? What do you mean? So, like if you're searching for K5. Yeah, so yeah that's a bad example. K5 is a bad example. Yes. Um, if we had, uh, oh yeah, I guess in this case you would always find it. Yes, that's fine. Yes, ignore what I said. So at this point, this is always visible, right? Because you would say K4, even if you pointed to K6, K5 is less than K6, so you would still drop down and see it. Yeah, so that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll come up with the, the corner case I'm talking about in a second. All right, so at this point, again, once I do compare and swap on this, everything's fully installed, so we're done. We're, we're done at this level. So then we just go now up here and do another compare and swap on this guy, have him point to us, and compare and swap on this, and now him points to us. And now our tower is fully installed and everyone can still see us. Right? Okay. So deletes are a little bit more tricky um, because we don't want to remove a node physically from memory and have a thread still be pointing at it. This looks a lot, this is going to sound a lot like the garbage collection stuff when we talk for MVCC, right? We don't want to come, have the garbage collector come and prune out old versions that expired when some thread could still possibly see that, right? In that case, we were, we were actually worried about both uh, threads logically not being able to see a version they should be able to see in their snapshot, but also you, do, you wouldn't want a, uh, a pointer to point to nothing and a thread jump along to that memory location and then and get screwed up. So at our point here, we're actually only worried about the physical problem, right? So what we're going to do is, when, if you want to delete a key, we're going to logically mark it deleted. And then technically, it'll still be in our index. And for a, uh, for a little bit, people can still scan along and still see our key, even though we deleted it. Then we'll go ahead and flip the pointers to now uh, route around it. And then at some later point, we'll come along with the garbage collector and once we know no thread is actually uh, ever looking at it, we can go ahead and, and clean it up. All right, we're, not, we're going to spend uh, more time in the next class about garbage collection uh, in, in, for these types of systems um, and indexes. We'll talk a little about how we do garbage collection in the context of the BW tree later in the, in the lecture. The concept is still the same. So what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce uh, this little delete flag here for every single node along the leaf node, along the bottom level. Um, we don't need it for the upper levels because, again, these are just guideposts, right? The bottom is always where the ground truth of what's going on in our index. So let's say we want to now delete K5. So our thread would do a search, find K5, find the, the bottom level here, and just flip this thing to true. And then it tells this, the data structure, the garbage structure, that, hey, by the way, I deleted this thread. Once you know that nobody else is actually looking at it, we can go ahead and, and clean it up. It also, actually, before it finishes, though, it's now going to go through and uh, flip the pointers as well to route, route around it. So for this, we can go start from the top and, and, and go down and do compare and swap for all of these. And then just like before, if, if we do the compare and swap and fail, then we know that somebody else has done something, either removed K6 or, or added a new entry like K4.5. So we just repeat the process and figure out where, where, what is actually here now, where our key five exists, and then just do the compare and swap on our predecessor in order to correctly add a, modify that. So sort of this two-stage part here is where I can mark this thing as deleted, and then any th thread that comes along and scans the bottom and, and sees it, just looks at the flag and says, I should ignore this information. It's not actually there. Um, and then to make sure that I can physically remove it, I do the compare and swap like this, and that way, you know, now it's physically decoupled from, from my index. And then at some later point, the garbage collector can say, all right, well, I know no thread is possibly looking at this. Let me go ahead and clean it up. Yes? So question about inserting. Yes. Uh, let's say you're trying to insert K5, and then you're comparing swap on the bottom level passes. But like, what if you're comparing swap on the second tier fails? Does that mean that you completely retry, or you just afford for second and third level? All right, so his question is, I'm here. My first compare and swap fails. 
That, that's, no, sorry, that succeeds, yes. Now I need to do it up here, and this one fails. Uh, so it, it would fail, and so, it, so here's the issue. It, it could be a race condition. So say there's somebody trying to install uh, 4.5, and I'm trying to install insert 5. So I said, that's a bad example. Say 5.5, because if I, if I get this guy in here, then the 4.5 would fail. Um, so he tries to install 5.5. So I succeed on this. So my guy now is linked in here. And then for whatever reason, my thread gets stalled, and then he comes along, and then he installs 5.5. Right, but at that point, I have a I have a handle to this thing. This is where I think I should be updating, and I know what the memory location is when I read it the first time. So now, when I try to do a compare and swap, the compare and swap will fail and say, "Whoa, what's up with that?" Let me go now, just do a search and figure out how you know figure out the thing I inserted because I know that succeeded. Then work back my way back up and figure out what what was the thing that actually came before me now. So in that case, now uh, I would see what's still K four. It's just the pointer that I thought should be pointing to uh, the end, is now pointing to 5.5, and now I just compare and swap and insert myself like that. Once I get it in the bottom, then it's fully, it's fully in there, and everyone, everyone will still be able to see it, it's just I need to make sure that I, I, I insert myself correctly going up. Yes? In the case of deletions, like let's say somebody is inserting 5.5 as I go to delete 5, Yes. and so they update my pointer, like they would while I was looking at K4's pointer. Mm -hmm. So both compare and swaps work, but that 5.5 ends up not in the link chain. Now. All right, so his, his question statement is that someone inserts 5.5 here, uh, and they compare and swap on me, so now I'm pointing to it. Now I do a compare and swap here. Uh, with K6. With K6, because I think that's what should come after me. And that will succeed because no one would get to me. Um, what should happen here? Is it special to just then look at myself again and see if my pointer changed? Yes. And then you you could. Um, Yes. So this this is this this is this is the example I was I was trying to think of. So there's a difference between serializability and linearizability. So for serializability, we don't want to see things that our transaction shouldn't see. For in terms of linearizability, like we can insert things into this and have it temporarily be inconsistent and have people not be able to see things we just inserted. That's okay. So if there's a brief period here where yes, I flip this guy, 5.5 is now here. I flip this, sorry, somebody else flip, flips me, now points to 5.5. I get flipped on this, and then uh, I would see that I'm now pointing to K6, 5.5 is missing. I could then go look at myself and say, I'm pointing now, I'm not pointing to what I should be pointing. Let me go ahead and fix, fix myself up. And then, then everything's correct. But then you're doing compare and swap for all of those things. And then, then that, fix, that fixes everything. I understand this distinction. So, like, as I'm running my transaction, if if my if someone if the 5.5 guy flips my pointer, then someone scans along and and misses me because they'll hit K4 and get routed to K6 and they miss 5.5. I should have seen that, but I didn't. Under uh, unless you're running with serializability, that's okay. If you're running with serializability, then you should have seen that. And there needs to be some extra mechanism to make sure that doesn't happen. So, and if you do what Hecaton does, you just run the scan again. Now the scan would see 5.5, and you recognize that you have a, a phantom, and therefore you have to abort the transaction because it fails validation. Yes? How would it eventually find out that 5.5 existed? So his question is how would you eventually find out that 5.5 existed? Yeah. I, so, I say I scan along the first time and I miss it. Now, under validation, like in Hecaton, they, they'll scan it again. But he was still down from 4 to 6. He's still up to 4 to 6. All right, so in that case there, I don't see it again. If you use reference counters, you call it, can, what do you mean? In this case, it's up to 
His statement is like if you have if you keep track of who actually points to you, yeah. you can't do that because it's two member. Now you got to do atomic updates on two member locations. You can't do that. Yeah. All right. The question of like should I be able to see that that well again so now think of like in uh, in like hyper so hyper was doing the precision locking so there would be a delta record with five point five and now when I do my validation I would see that that I, I should have seen that and I didn't and therefore that would violate serializability but that's okay from again the data structure point of view it's okay. From the higher level concept of transactions, that is not okay. We have to do extra stuff to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. All right, so I want to jump ahead to the BW trees because this is, to me, this is a more interesting data structure. Uh, skip lists are terrible, don't use them. Okay. All right, so this is exactly the point I was trying to say here. Because uh, the, the comparison swap can only update a single address at a time, this sort of limits what you actually can do in your data structure. In particular, we couldn't do that reverse search because we can only have pointers going one direction. We can't update two memory locations at the same time. Right? Also because of this, we can't have a lat tree B plus tree because the B plus tree has pointers all over the place. So now if I have to change a memory location of, of a node because of a split or a merge, and I gotta update a bunch of, bunch of, a bunch of pointers to it now, I can't do that atomically without taking latches. So for this reason, so the, the canonical B plus tree, you know, as we teach you in the introduction class, you can't make that lat tree even though everything's in memory. So the way to get around this limitation, if you want a B plus tree, uh, is you can introduce an indirection layer that's going to allow you to update multiple addresses, logical addresses, all with a single compare and swap on a single memory location. And that's the main idea of what the BW tree is. So the BW tree came out of the Hecaton project. I think I mentioned this before. They first started building Hecaton using skip lists, did some benchmarks and realized skip lists weren't that great, and then they ended up building this, this new data structure called the BW tree. The BW stands for buzzword. Right? The idea is that, like, it's a latch-free, flash-organized, like, so forth, uh, index. So the original paper came out in 2013. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a second, but like when I read this paper, I was like, this is awesome. Like, you know, I was going to, you know, sign up to come to Carnegie Mellon. We're going to build a new database. And I said, let's build a BW tree, right? So the first time I cut this class in like 2016, one of the projects that we had the students do was actually build a BW tree. That was a nightmare because that was way too hard. Uh, and I learned that it was way too hard. Um, and then in previous years, we did skip lists, but I don't think that's interesting. So we, we ditched that. Um, Anyway, so, but this original paper, it describes, I think it does a good job of describing at a high level what the BW, BW tree is, but the, like, the nitty gritty details of when you actually need to actually implement it are not in this paper. So the paper that you guys read was sort of our attempt at writing the missing guide on what you would need to actually build a re, real BW tree. But then what happened was, as we implemented it, and then when we benchmarked it, it got crushed by everything. And so, the paper you guys read it sort of has a split brain because the first half of the paper is like, hey, here's how to build it. And the second half is, oh, by the way, it sucks, right? Because as we were writing, doing the experiments, we're like, oh, man, we can't write this. Like, we got to be upfront. Like, this is, thing is not that good. Here's why, right? But again, so the, you can get bits and pieces of how to build the rest of the BW tree, the other things you need, from a bunch of other papers that came out of Microsoft for this other system called Deuteronomy, but it's sort of, again, it's sort of scattered across these different papers. You have to know where, what you're looking for to find it. And our paper is meant to be like the single source to describe everything. So there's two main ideas that you, or the main takeaways you have to have for how the BW tree is implemented. So the first is that they're gonna use deltas to record changes made to single nodes. So you're not gonna allow, to, you're not allowed to do any in-place updates to pages or nodes once, once they're created. Right, contrast that with the BW or B plus tree. Right, B plus tree, I allocate a bunch of space and I can add new, uh, or a a allocate a node, I can add new entries into it you know, and, and take things away you know, as needed. So now their argument was that this will help reduce cache and validation. I don't buy this argument because when you do deltas, you know, those deltas get, get propagated to between cores. Um, so that's not really, uh, that, th this is slightly, not, this is not true. Then now to make it latch free, they're gonna introduce a mapping table, this indirection layer, 
that's going to map logical node IDs, or logical page IDs, to physical locations in memory. So now if I want to change the location of a page, I all I have to do is compare and swap into a single memory address in my mapping table. And that updates all my pointers. Uh, so a quick show of hands, who, who feels like they understand the BW tree after reading the, that paper? Sort of one. Nobody. Okay. That's fine. Um, no, it's a, hard, it's a hard data structure, right? It's, it's, it's a, people think lat tree data structures are sort of magically are going to run faster. No, but also they're also you know, much, much harder to implement. Skip lists are super easy, right? Uh, it's just a bunch of linked lists and you flip a coin. The, the BW tree is, is a way more complicated beast because it's the corner cases that, that fuck you up. Okay, so this is a really simple example of our BW tree. We have uh, three nodes, we have one root, and then two leaf nodes. So the first thing is that every single page, every single node, is going to be assigned a logical node ID, right? Page 101, 102, 103. Oh, that should be, yeah, that should be 103. Um, no, it is 104, sorry. Uh, and then now in our mapping table, we're going to have a map from the logical page ID to the physical location in memory where that page exists. So the way I'm demarcating this is that the, the, so the, the dark line is the physical address, a physical pointer, and then the red dotted lines are logical pointers. So the way that we're going to organize the, the tree to keep track of like my, my children and my siblings is that I'm just going to store the logical page ID instead of actually the physical pointer. So now if I, if I want to do a scan along this thing, say I start at page 101 and I want to jump down to my child 102, I do the lookup in the mapping table and say I want 102 and then I get the physical address and now I know where to jump to. Right? Pretty simple, but it gets harder. So now also too, because we don't want to have in-place updates to our pages, we're going to introduce these delta chains where we append modifications that occur to the elements within a page to this like linked list above it, right? So every single time I want to do an update for something in my page, I create a new delta record. So in this case here, I want to insert k0, key zero into this page. So I create a new delta record that just records that I'm inserting this key. This delta record is going to have a physical pointer to the base page, right? To, to the head of the base page here, whatever this thing's pointing to. And then now, to install this update, I go to the mapping table and I want to do a compare and swap to change the physical pointer to now point to my delta record instead of the page ID or to, to the, the base page. So if that compare and swap succeeds, then now my modification is now fully installed in the, in the page. And any other thread comes along and says, I want to get to page 102, they do the lookup into the the page table, they would get a pointer to this delta record. There'll be a little bit in the, in the header that says you're looking at a delta record, not a page. And then it knows how to then interpret whatever, the, the, whatever information is being recorded in, in that delta record um, to find whatever it needs to find or to, you know, to, to do whatever it is that it needs to do. So now let's say I want to do a, a delete on K, uh, key 8 in my base page. So same thing. I follow the, 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 the mapping table. Would tell me that I'm pointing here. This is the current head of, the, of the, the, the delta chain. So my physical pointer for this new delta record I want to install points to this guy here, not the base page. Then same thing. I do a compare and swap. If it succeeds, now my, my delta record has been installed. All right, is this clear? All right. All right, to do searches, again, as I said, when I do my lookup in the, uh, in, in the page table, well, first I'm doing traversal like a regular B plus tree, but now when I do my lookup, if I land into a delta chain, then now I have to start looking to see what those delta records are and see whether they correspond to the key that I'm looking for. Right? So in this case here, say I was looking for key zero, I, and I land, to, I land in, the, in the mapping table, I get to the head of the delta chain, my first delta record says delete K8, that's not the one I'm looking for, so I skip that. I go down here, it says insert K0, that's the one I, I want, so I know I'm done. And I can return, you know, just, just as if I had, had you know, scanned the bottom or something like that. If you get through all the, the delta chain and you get down to the base page, uh, not finding the key you're looking for, then you just do binary search on the keys, because this, internally this looks just like a B plus G node. You're going to have separator keys and, and the arrays for the values. 
So I just do binary search until I find the keyword that I want. All right? So again, what's really nice about this mapping table is that since this is the sort of the, the ground truth of what the physical pointer is for a single page, then the comp all I need to do is compare and swap on that, and that determines who actually gets gets to succeed and install updates. All right. So let's say if I go back here and remove that delete, and I'm I'm only have inserted key zero in here. So now I have two threads. One guy wants to insert, install key eight. Another guy wants to install key six. Again, they both do the compare and swap on this location. Only one of them will succeed, right? Because they both did a lookup and say, well, what is the current address in this? And then do compare and swap on that. If, if, say, the first guy succeeds, the second guy fails, then I blow away my delta record. I guess you don't have to blow it away, but I, I go, let me go figure out what, what, was, what got installed in front of me, and then now retry it and maybe do, and do compare and swap on the, the new address. Right, whether, you have, whether or not you have to start from the beginning again or whether you can just recognize that, oh, well, this is where the head now is. Let me just go back and do that again. Depends on implementation. So what's the problem with these delta chains? Yes. They get long. They get long, exactly, yes. What's that? Sorry, yes. So a delta page only has one delta in it. Or... So his, his question is, a, a delta record, you're saying delta page, does it only have one in it? In the... In our implementation, no. And we'll see this in, in a bit. Uh, the, way, the easiest way to think about this, these are just malloc, some, some chunk of memory, and this is just a linked list pointer. But you don't actually want to implement it that way because it's way too slow. Right. So as he said, it's, uh, these delta chains can grow infinitely. So at some point, we want to consolidate them. right? So what the way it basically works is that you in our implementation, the number of delta records you have is fixed. In the original uh, Hecaton paper from Microsoft, they say that these things can grow arbitrarily, and therefore you just have a threshold and say, at some point, this is when I want to consolidate. So there's no background garbage collector thread doing this. It's just as, as threads scan along, if they recognize, oh, this delta chain has got pretty long, then at that point in time, as they're doing the scan or doing the lookup, they try to do the consolidation. So in this case here, this guy gets too long, so a thread's going to do consolidation. So the very first thing you do is just copy the original base page into a new page, right? And then you apply the delta records in reverse order. So I'll first do the insert, and then delete, and then the insert up there. Let me take a guess why you do this in, in reverse order. Consistency, correct, right? So let's say I insert key, key, uh, key zero here. Then up above this, there's a delete key, key zero. I, I don't, if I go from the bottom to, from the top to the bottom, then I would have key zero when it shouldn't be. So going in reverse order, replays them uh, correctly and then, and then puts it back to the correct state. All right, so now at this point, after I've, I've applied all of my, uh, my changes, I just do the same thing I did before. I go back to the mapping table, do a compare and swap, and then if that succeeds, then now I know that uh, my node has been installed that has, that's been consolidated. Yes? So did you see it was the thread that, for example, it's looking up key zero, that recognizes that it's time to consolidate that. So it's that thread which does it? Or? His question is, what is the mechanism, or what is the trigger to, to, to recognize that I need to do consolidation? And which thread does it? And which thread does it? So uh, it's, I think in the original paper, it's whoever reaches the bottom, and you, and you recognize the thing's long enough. Uh, but you still could still could end up missing it. I, f I forget what the exact mechanism is. I think like you could just keep a counter in this thing to say I'm I'm at offset zero. I'm at offset one. So when it, if you reach the top one, right, when you start, you would say, oh, this is the twelfth delta record in my chain. I should go ahead and consolidate. And, it, and, who, and the person that does it, whoever just finds it. So this is again this is another advantage of the compare and swap because I could have two threads come along and say, oh, this thing's super long. Let me both consolidate it. So then they both end up doing it. Only one compare and swap will succeed, and that's fine. But the other one is just wasted. Yeah, the other one wasted work. But again, that's that's this will be a reoccurring theme in in, in like you know lot tree data structures. There's it's wasted work, but you can't avoid that, right? The idea is that the the work the amount of work you're wasting is less than the overhead of having to stall weight on latches, right? Whether that's true or not depends. Yes. 
So what if you um, compare and swap to two consolidated nodes at the same time? Right before you do the compare and swap, um, someone tried to do an insert into the old node, right? Okay. So then now that insertion is missed in the consolidated node. Okay, so his, so his question is, say I, I'm, I'm here. I've already done my consolidation. I've applied all my delta record changes, right? Yeah. And then now, before I do the compare and swap here, somebody else inserts key six, right? What would happen? I would do a, try to do compare and swap on this, but this is no longer going to point to, point to that. I know where I started because I had that pointer. And, that, and, I, and, I, and I went in reverse order and added all those guys. So now when I do the compare and swap on this, and it's no longer insert key six, it's now insert key, or key now it's, it's no longer insert key five, it's now insert key six. I know I didn't see that and I missed that. So therefore I know that this thing is not in sync with what should be there. So therefore I either have to, uh, I can be smart and try to pick up, pick up where I left off or what, what I'm missing, or I just do the whole thing all over again. Again, the compare and swap guarantees that it doesn't happen because if someone else inserts something, this thing will no longer point to the thing I, th I thought I should point to. Right? I, hopefully, I, my excitement is coming, coming off, uh, uh, I'm conveying my excitement. And this is why we ended up building, because like, damn, this thing's so awesome. It solves everything. But then, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at this point here, I back a parent swap succeeds. I then tell the garbage collector that this, this thing is old. Right? And at some point it should be reclaimed, or it should reclaim the memory. Of course, then again, I don't want to do it just willy-nilly because I don't know what threads could be looking in, inside of this. So the way we're going to do garbage collection in the BW tree is through epochs. Uh, if you're coming from OS background, uh, Linux uses something very similar. They call it RCU, right? Um, the basic, and I would say also too, this, this epoch-based garbage collection we're talking about here is not specific to the BW tree. You could do the same, you can do the same thing, and you, people usually do the same thing in a skip list. Right? And we'll see other data structures uh, that would use something very similar. All right, so the basic idea is that all the operations we're going to do in our BW tree are going to be tagged with whatever the current epoch is. And think of the epoch as just a counter, a logical counter where you add one to it every so often. Right? You know, think of like every 50 milliseconds, it doesn't matter. So then when a thread enters the system, they register themselves with the garbage collector, and the garbage collector keeps track of all the threads that are currently inside my index at this current epoch. And then when they do whatever they're, uh, you know, as they make changes to the index and then have garbage that needs to be reclaimed, they register that garbage with the, the, the garbage collector and say, within this epoch, I created, uh, I created this old, old, old pages, go ahead and clean it up. And then the garbage collector knows that once all the threads have left the current epoch and any epoch that came before it, then it knows there's no thread could be pointing, could be looking at the physical memory that I'm going to reclaim, and therefore it's safe for me to remove it. Same idea we saw with garbage collection for MVCC. If I know no other thread, it could be looking at some old versions, at these old snapshots, it's safe for me to reclaim it. All right, so let's look at an example here. So this is the same one we had before, right? We have one thread running on CPU one. They're going to do the consolidation of this page down here, right? So again, when it enters the system, it's going to say, "Tell the uh, the garbage collector, I'm a thread. I'm going to do some stuff. Here, here, you know, here, here I am." And so for this one, we're just going to have one epoch. It's fine. Another thread is coming along, and they're scanning this delta chain, right? So after again, same thing, they get registered. So after now, I do my compare and swap on this page here. I, this thing is now fully installed. Any other thread that comes in after this epoch will see this. It won't see this. But I don't know about where, where, where thread two is, is. I don't know what it's looking at. I don't know whether it's looking at this delta chain, whether it's looking at another part in the tree. I don't know and I don't care because I don't want to track its fine grain access. I'm just saying it's in this epoch and that's good enough. All right, so then I again register all this this. This, this memory to be reclaimed with the, with the epoch, epoch table and the garbage collector. I go away, I deregister myself. This thing continues to scan, and then at some point it's done. It tells the garbage collector, I'm, I'm done, you know, I'm leaving the index, and then now it knows it's safe to reclaim this. So there's some mechanism, again, where a thread will just say, all right, it's been 50 milliseconds, 
let me increment the epoch counter, right? So there's some, some, some like almost like a heartbeat always moving forward in time, right? And that I know what threads could be around in, in, in the epoch. And once I know that every, for a given epoch, there's no threads that exist in that epoch and any epoch before it, I can reclaim it. Again, in the case of uh, like the HANA garbage collection, st garbage collection stuff we talked about, they were worried about these really long uh, queries, you know, running for hours, and therefore there's a bunch of garbage in the middle you want to reclaim, but you can't. So that's why they want to do that interval garbage collection, right? You think of the epoch one as, as like the timestamp version, which is the high water mark or the low water mark when you, we can remove stuff. In our index, we're not worried about things taking hours, where we're talking like microseconds here. So it's okay that there might be like five epochs that uh, I want to reclaim garbage from, and there's some thread that's taking a little bit longer that's causing all of them to get stalled. It, again, we're talking microseconds here. So it, it's fine. So it's, have, it's okay to have a coarse grain epoch-based uh, policy, and we don't need to worry about intervals. Okay. So let's get to the hard part. How we actually how we actually do uh, structure modifications? So it's again the B, the BW tree is basically a, a lat tree B plus tree. It's self balancing, so that means we have to do splits and merges just like in a B plus tree. So that gets a little tricky now when you have these delta chains and 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 these this mapping table. So what we're, the way we're going to handle this is that we're going to introduce two new types of delta records that are going to correspond to physical changes in our index. Uh, and to keep track of where the logical, uh, the, where the, 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 the logical contents of different pages can be stored. So we're going to have a split delta record uh, that keeps track of where certain ranges of a key from a page can be found, whether it's one, you know, left or right. And then we'll have a separated delta record, which is a shortcut mechanism for higher parts of the tree to allow us to not have to go scan through the entire delta chain just to find that the data we're looking for is, is on another node. So we're going to do splits here in, 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 in the next slide. For merge, it's the same process, just done in reverse. Right, there's there's no, nothing extra, nothing special you do. All right, so this is like the simplest example I could come up with. Um, and even, even it's, it's still kind of nasty, but that's okay. All right, so we're going to have uh, four nodes, three leaf nodes, one, one root node here. Again, same thing. Everybody has their own unique page ID, and then they're going to have uh, logical pointers in between them. So in the BW tree, you're actually going to have pointers in both directions, like a B link tree. But for our, again, to keep it simple, we're, we're only, only going to go one way. All right, so say these are the keys that we have stored. Uh, uh, from one to two on the first guy, three to six on the second one, and then seven to eight to this one. So we want to do a split on this, this one here, right? So the first thing we're going to do is just create a new page and copy the keys we want to split on, key five and key six, we'll copy them into our new page here. Right? You, there's, there's a delta chain, whatever, you, you apply it, it's fine. Right? So now at this point, uh, again, and, and you update the, the, the mapping table now to point to us. So again, at this point, nobody can see us because there's no, there, no, nobody's pointing to us. Right? Nobody knows about us. Right? This thing still points here, and this guy still points there. So we're going to introduce this new split delta record here. And this is going to go in the version chain in, in, for this page here. And so what the split record basically says is that uh, it's going to have two points. It's going to have a physical one and a logical one. So the physical one will say, here's all the keys on, on the left side of the tree, right? Key three, to key three, key four, so K5 exclusive. And then on the right side, here's all the keys on, over here, right? And again, the physical pointer points to this page here because this is in this delta chain. It's not in this delta chain here. So now at this point, uh, in order to full install it, again, I, I do compare and swap on this guy to now point to set up page one or three, since this is the head of the delta chain, now points, points to our split record. So at this point here, our key is, is uh, our split is fully installed, and now everyone can see our page, right? Because when we updated this physical pointer, it also updated these logical pointers to now point to us. So now any thread that comes along and say they're looking for key five, they would jump down into here, right, and see that key five is in the range uh, from key five to key seven, so they would follow that logical pointer here. Even though we still have copies of key from key six here, as well as here, 
this is the one that I'm going to read at this point if they follow those logical pointers, All right? So again, up above, we don't know about the split. Uh, and so all we have here is everyone thinks key 3 to key 7, you follow this logical pointer, and then they find the split, and then you go left or right. All right? So to avoid this extra work of having to go uh, you know, follow this down and just to find out that the thing I really want is over here, I can introduce a separator key up above. And this is a basically a way to say, if you're looking for this key here, to, to modify this and say, the, the, if you're looking for something in that range, jump to this, this location here. So as far as I know, for correctness, you don't need this. The, the separator does a record. It's just done for convenience to avoid having to scan all the way down and do extra work just to find out you're actually really down here. All right? And then same thing. We, we flip that pointer to now point to that, and now everyone can see us. And then at some later point, we'll do, we'll do consolidation, right? So this thing will get compacted. We remove key 5, key 6, right? And when we create a new page. All right, so this is different than a B plus tree. B plus tree wouldn't have the, the co multiple copies of the keys of, of one key exist in any leaf node, right? It can only exist once. In our case here, because we're doing consolidation at later points in time, uh, it's OK that this thing can still exist, right? Everyone has to keep track of what they're allowed to see when they land on this node. So if I'm scanning along the leaf node here, and I'm looking for, uh, say, key 6, if I come along this, then scan along this pointer here, and then I would recognize, that, oh, the thing I really want is actually down here. So even though I, may jump, I could jump here and, and see it, I know it, I still go to that one. All right, is this all clear? Yes? So, so does the sibling pointer in the base node, is that just irrelevant at that point? So this question is, is this, oh, is, is this sibling pointer here in the base node just irrelevant? Right, once you actually did the split? Yes, because you, you, yeah, you would keep track up up here that like, the now sibling of this guy is here, right? And that's being maintained here. So as I, as I scan down to this thing, I got to keep track. Well, I saw that I had a split up above. So if I need to jump over here, I had to jump down here. Blank faces. OK. So I think he brought this up earlier. Like, wh what are these delta records? Are they just malloc in, in the heap, right? Well, again, if you read the original BWG paper, they, you know, they don't, they don't tell you, right? And you don't want to do that, right? Because if you malloc those little delta records just randomly in the heap as needed, then you're doing a bunch of small little memory allocations, and that sucks, right? You're going to have fragmentation. Uh, you're hitting up the, the, the malloc all the time, and that's bad. So the, again, the paper I had you guys read, the, the sort of first third of it describes actually how to build the BW tree and the missing parts from Microsoft. Then the next third is, is, is these additional optimizations, and then we get to the actual performance evaluation. So I want to talk about two optimizations that are pretty straightforward to understand to make things run faster. So the first is that the delta chain really isn't actually just a linked list. You're just going to uh, have a little extra space in each page, in each node, where you can store these delta records. So you have your delta slots, and then you just have a counter, an offset, to say, at what position can you come along and insert Delta record here. So this means you have a fixed number of delta records per page, and at some point when you try to insert a new delta record, you have to do the consolidation. Whereas in the, in, in the Microsoft paper, it just was when the thing got long enough above some threshold, then you did it. In our case here, we run out of space, we have to do it. So if a thread comes along and says that they want to install a new delta record, right? they do compare and swap on this guy, or an atomic add, and they try to add one to it. right? And if they, if they succeed, then they know whatever this thing had before is, is, is now claimed by, by our thread to install a new delta record for this. And then just like before, we do the compare and swap on the mapping table to now point to us. All right? Now, there's some extra metadata we have to maintain because this thing is done at, is a, you know, this is one compare and swap. And then changing the mapping table is another compare and swap. But I may have one thread get the first slot here and install something. And then the second thread comes along and he installs something, and then he gets to the mapping table before I do. 
So this thing may not be in physical order. Uh, sorry, may not, may not be in logical order. So I may have to keep track. I have to keep track of like what is the actual order of these delta records I want to apply. So it's not just like starting here and just scanning across. Right, because again, I can't update two memory addresses at the same time. So I can do a compare and swap on this, get a slot, then do a compare and swap on that, and then someone might beat me to it. But that's still fine. The second issue we had to deal with was the, 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 the size of the mapping table. So the way the mapping table is actually implemented, is not, it's not a real table. It's just an array. Right, even though I sort of draw it as a hash table, it's just an, a flat array. Right, of 64-bit pointers to point to different memory locations for pages. So the, if you end up allocating the in, entire array first, then you're basically wasting a lot of space so that may never actually be used. The reason why you have to allocate the entire memory ahead of time is because you can't make expanding that memory latch-free. Right, I can't call realloc because somebody else might be doing it at the same time, and, and that'll cause problems. So then you say, well, maybe I partition the, the, the size of the, uh, the, the mapping table so I can re incrementally reallocate new parts and then have some pointers above that to you know, say, if you want this portion of the mapping table go here, this part of the mapping table go there. Now I'm just basically building a B, B, B plus tree, right? So I'm screwed there. So the way to get around this is you do pre-allocate the entire array, but you use virtual memory and have that uh, and only use the portion of that virtual memory that you actually need. So again, the page IDs are just offsets into this array. So if I only have maybe like a thousand nodes or a thousand pages, I'm only using the first 1,000 entries in my array. And then although I have allocated the entire thing, all that virtual memory, which is not actually backed by physical memory, the OS, like if I do virtual memory allocation on a big space, if I don't touch any of it, the, the OS doesn't actually allocate anything. It's only when I try to access a memory location, then there's a page fault, and then the OS actually creates the backing physical memory for it. So with virtual memory, I can, can, I can allocate the entire thing, and only when I actually touch it, then is, is the memory actually created. Yes? Doesn't the OS handle this? Like, what about the physical Yeah, so his question is, doesn't the OS handle this? Yes. And when I say, yeah, like, we're not doing anything special, we're using the OS as virtual memory to do this. So, like, how come, like, the original memory location is not physical? Like, if there's... Allocate certain memory to the G. Does not automatically happen on the OS. Uh, if, if you, um, yeah, so the statement is if you just allocate a, a big chunk of memory uh, and you don't touch any of it, isn't the OS still going to do this? Correct. I think in the original paper they used, they used a hash table. Right? And if you do that, you're jumping to random, random locations. This technique actually came from, uh, there's another paper called a KISS tree, which is, is another latch tree data structure that we got this idea from them. Just to, to, to understand why we did this, like I actually look in, in the code today, the, the default is that we al allow for mapping tables of 1 million nodes, right? So if it's 1 million nodes and each node can have 128 uh, uh, keys, so the current version of the BW tree, it's, it's, there's no reason it couldn't be bigger, it's just 128 million keys. So for every single index, if you want to store 1 million nodes, we would end up malloking 8 megabytes. Doesn't seem like a lot, but if you have like two indexes, two or three indexes per table, and you have like 100 tables, then you're just allocating the memory before you even put any data in it. So we saw this when we were using Peloton. We, we turn the thing on and just you know install the TPCC database schema, and we'd be like 200 megabytes. I'm like, how's this 200 megabytes? We didn't we didn't do anything yet, right? Go try this on SQLite. Create tables on SQLite, and like the memory footprint is like nothing. So this allowed us to avoid this problem um, by just, again, using, using virtual memory for this. All right, so I want, to, I want to show two sets of experiments and we'll finish up. So first one is from the original BW tree paper from uh, 20, 2013. So these are internal benchmarks that Microsoft did using uh, some workloads that they had on hand, like some data set from Xbox, the Xbox Live, uh, some synthetic workload, and then some dedupe workload. So this is the graph I saw, and I was like, man, this is awesome. I, I, I want to build a BW tree, too. Right? So they're comparing the BW tree versus the skip list they originally built for Hecaton versus the B plus tree from Berkeley DB. And so they modified Berkeley DB to make the B plus tree actually be in memory. If you've never heard of Berkeley DB, think of like, uh, like Rocks DB or LevelDB or SQLite, where it's like an embedded database engine that provides you like, like low-level 
you know, distant data structures like a hash table and a B plus tree. It's awesome. So, yeah, it, I mean, it's an awesome system, but it's like from 92, right? So they're using an old, old B plus tree in their comparison here, and it's, it's no surprise that, that, that it gets crushed. So like, yeah, yeah. So I, when I saw this, I'm like, yes, this is the way to go. We should build this. So then we did build it. And then these are our benchmark numbers where uh, we compared against a sort of a, it wasn't like super advanced, but a, a, a modern B plus tree provided to us by the hyper guys in Germany. Like we had, he was a visitor with us uh, for, for two months, a few years ago, and he came along with the B plus tree they used for hyper. And this, this you know, it, it crushes the, the BW tree here. So for the skip list here, again, skip list always loses. Skip list always sucks. This is actually the state of the art skip list from uh, Alan Fecky's group down in Australia. So it doesn't use towers, it uses wheels, whatever, right? Like the, the basic idea is the same. So we're calling our version of the BW tree, the open BW tree, because again, Microsoft never open sourced theirs, we open sourced ours. It has all the enhancements and the optimizations that you guys wrote about in the paper. So again, for a variety of workloads, the, with the exception of doing inserts, the, 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 the bus tree always wins. And this is running on a machine with, with one socket, 10 cores, with hyperthreading, so it's a total of 20 cores. Whereas Microsoft were running on, a, uh, on eight cores, right, because it's back in 2013. So then, when you want to get even more embarrassed, is when we actually now compare against a bunch of other data structures, which we'll, we'll discuss next class. So this is, again, this is the BW tree, the, the skip list, the modern skip list, and the B plus tree. But now we're also throwing in the mash tree and the art index, right? So you will read, the, the signed reading for next class is the art index. It's a, it's a radex tree, it's a try. So mash tree is a tree of tries. Again, we, we will discuss what these guys are next class. So now you see like the, the radix tree crushes everything, right? And the main takeaway here is that both the, the, the Radix tree, Mass tree, and the B plus tree are all using latches. So just because you're latch free doesn't make you magically, yeah, magically go faster. It actually ends up doing worse, right? So at this point, we're stuck with the BW tree. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, getting to work. And you know, as we build out our new system, we're keeping it, keeping it for now. Um, at some point, I would like consider maybe looking at the uh, Either, either a B plus tree or maybe something that looks like a mass tree. Um, the radix tree has some limitations that we'll, we'll talk about next class. Um, it's, for scans, it's not as good as, as, a, as a B plus tree, right? Because you, you can't scan along the leaf nodes. You have to jump up and down, okay? So again, like, I don't want to make it sound like I'm taking a on the BW tree. I really liked it. I spent two years of my life helping build it and writing this paper. It's just, you know, you have to face the hard, cold, hard scientific facts that it, it, compared to you know, sort of classical data structures using latches, it gets crushed. It is what it is. All right, so what are the main takeaways here? So hopefully now in this lecture, uh, you saw that some of the things we talked about, like with garbage collection, overlaps a lot with the MPCC stuff we talked about before. Right, worrying about what threads are in, in the system, what, what things we need to clean up, what's pointing to what. Um, and so it's this really interesting idea where the, 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 the index is almost like its own little database in itself, but it has to still interact with the outside, outside world, which is the, the database around it and the table that, that it's connected to. Um, so I think there are some efforts to actually maybe unify the epochs within the index and the epochs within multi-versioning. Um, we don't do that. I don't think everybody else has, done, has attempted this yet, but I know people have, have sort of been thinking about this. So one of the main takeaways for the last free data structures we talked about is that the, the skip list is super, super easy to implement. The concurrent skip list, the compare and swap, is slightly harder, but not, not too hard. And the BW tree is, is a nightmare. Right? We spent um, a, probably a year and a half to get it actually into the shape that it is today. Right? The kid that wrote it is a freak, too. Like he's one of the best programs we've ever had. He, the rumor going around is he wrote a portion of it in Notepad. Um, he's that crazy. Uh, and it works, right? So uh, anyway, so um, Zeke's a funny guy. All right, um, and he, he's, he wrote it on a notepad on a machine, in his laptop that, that runs Windows 10, but he configures Windows 10 to make it look like Windows 95. And then he sets the default font to Comic Sans. Like, it's hardcore, right? <laughs> 
All right. So, all right. Anyway, so it's hard to do. Uh, we have, we think we have the best open source implementation of the BW tree. There's been a couple other systems that's shown up on Hacker News where they've built their own BW tree, but I don't think they go to the full extent that, that we have. Like they don't do all the optimizations that we talk about unless they pick it, take our, take our paper and, and run with it. All right. Next class. We'll talk more about how to do garbage collection. We'll talk about more about how you actually represent keys in the indexes, but then we'll spend most of our time talking about the tri data structures. So mass tree and then the art index, which are both radix trees. Okay. Any questions? No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said, the paint eyes red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some same knives and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.